pleasure and I am honoured to introduce our speaker for this evening, who is Professor Richard Clegg, he's the Foundation Chief Executive of Lloyd's Register Foundation, which is a global charity with a mission to enhance the safety of life and property and advance public education. The Foundation is a major supporter of science and engineering related research, skills and education, public outreach and accelerating technology to application. Prior to heading the Foundation, Richard had a strong scientific background in industry, government and academia, principally in the civil and defence nuclear sectors. He was founding director of the Delta Nuclear Institute and also Research Dean of Engineering and Physical Sciences at the University of Manchester. He sits on a number of UK government and industry advisory committees, is a trustee of the Science Museum Group in London, and he's a fellow of the Royal Academy of Engineering and a fellow of the Royal Society of Chemistry. Richard, Lord Lovely. Thank you very much, everybody. I'd have saved that to the end. Uh, I'm going to take my jacket off because I've never done my best work with the jacket on. So, um, okay. Well, as the introduction says, my name is Richard. Richard Clay, that's me up there. Uh, and I'm the chief executive of something called Lloyd's Register Foundation. And uh, my background is that, well, I was a chemist. I used to work in the nuclear industry. And I've done some really interesting jobs uh, in the civil industry. I was a chief scientist on the atomic weapons program. I worked in government on counterproliferation, and I worked in Lloyd's, and now I head Lloyd's. Um, so really, really interesting journey. The pinnacle of which is why I've been here, been in Liverpool. Uh, <laughs> um, and uh, tonight I'm going to uh, just talk for a short while on this subject here, sort of about risk. And it's about perceptions versus data. Um, but what I thought I'd cover is um, um, is just up here. So a, a little bit of scene setting. Um, um, but then um, this is not an advertorial about noise register. So I don't really want to go on too much about that. But I'm going to say something uh, about uh, my company. Uh, and my foundation, because I think it's important context, it helps you understand where I'm coming from um, and why I look at the world uh, through certain glasses with risk on them. So it'll just help uh, as a bit of a backdrop. So I'm going to say something about uh, noise register. Um, I'm then going to sort of stretch it out a little bit and I'm going to talk about risk in the context of disruptive technologies. And I'm going to particularly say something uh, about the uh, interconnected digital world that we live in today and the benefits but the risks associated with that as well. And then I'm going to close out by talking about the public understanding of risk. Um, and this is so important uh, because making the world a safer place isn't all about physical sciences and engineering big component part, but not exclusively that. Um, because it's all about people as well. Um, and public anxiety, public tolerance, public understanding. And the slides that I've got here are actually some slides that I used a number of months ago uh, to a general audience, a public audience, um, on risk. Um, so it's a really sort of stripped back, and it's as if I'm talking to my mom, really. So, uh, oh, that's good. And then, and then uh, any Q&A at the end. Okay? So, does that, is that what you came for? Is that all right? Did I? Okay. Okay, so first of all, some background uh, about the Lloyd's Register Foundation. So here we've got um, six things about Lloyd's Register, five or six things. If you listen to this slide, you can go to sleep for the rest, because uh, this is important. So, this is about the Lloyd's Register Foundation. So, we are a charity, okay? We happen to be the largest charity by revenue in the country, but we are a charity. 
Okay, number one. And our mission, our charitable purpose, the reason why we're on the planet, is twofold. To enhance the safety of life and property, and advance public education. So if you strip the varnish off it, that's what we're on the planet for. Safety and public education. Science, engineering, technology related. And we are based in the UK. My offices are in London. Uh, Lloyd's is based in London, in the city. Um, but we're global. Um, and uh, I'll illustrate that in a moment. Now the beautiful thing, as far as I'm concerned, about being a charity is, well, where do we get our money from? And we get our money from the fact that we own Lloyd's. Uh, my foundation owns Lloyd's Register. So I'm a charity uh, that owns a billion pound trading arm uh, with 10,000 staff in 68 countries. Um, and it's a private company, happens to be 257 years old, um, but we own it, um, and it provides us with an income. Okay. And I'll say some more about that in a moment. And some of the things that drives us, or the two things that drive us, like lots of other organisations as well, impact and excellence. Um, and impact for us is making the world safer. Right, so everything that we do, every groat that we spend, has got to be in line with our charitable purpose and demonstrably help make the world a safer place. So that's all. Uh, that's uh, about the Lloyd's Register Foundation. This is a really interesting picture because I've talked about the fact that we have a trading arm um, and that, uh, that I'm a charitable foundation. And this is a, a sort of a diagram picture, I'll walk you through it, which helps you understand how both our trading arm, which we call the Lloyd's Register Group, and the charity part of Lloyd's Register, the Lloyd's Register Foundation, work together to make the world a safer place. Um, so the two halves, a commercial business and a charity, the commercial business makes the world a safer place by selling services to clients and to sectors. Okay, 35,000 clients around the world. Um, and it makes the world safer. These services are professional services, inspection, certification, uh, we look at people's designs for things, whether it's a nuclear power station or a ship, uh, and we will certify that design against certain standards. Okay. The fact that our trading arm gets paid for it is a bonus, but it makes the world safer. Um, and, uh, and then we've got the charitable part, which also makes the world safer, not by selling services, uh, but by working with wider society and communities, and we give grants. We make investments as grants. So you put the foundation of the group together, and we're serving clients, sectors, communities, and society. <coughs> um, and those two things work together to make the world a safer place. Okay. And the way that I like to describe this is that, to me, it is a 21st century model for doing social business. We trade, we make money, nothing wrong with making money, but we're good capitalists in so much as the money that we make goes back into the societies that we serve. It doesn't go sideways and pay uh, private in, uh, investors, equity firms. It's just owned by our foundation. We put it all back into society. So, um, the 21st model for doing social business. Okay, So we're good social capitalists. Uh, and, uh, uh, and I was talking to some of our trainees the other day, some graduate trainees, and I found myself saying, and I thought, it's really got to remember that. I don't very often say things that are interesting. But I say, um, lots of companies do things to make money, and we make money to do things. And I think it's just a nice way of, of, of wrapping it up. So that's how Lloyd's Register Group and Lloyd's Register Foundation sort of work together, making the world a safer place. I just want to say something um, to help you get your head around. I'm in the foundation now, I'm in the foundation space, the right hand side of that last picture. Um, charitable mission, make the world a safer place, enhance safety of life and property, and advance public education. I've said that. If you get underneath that, you scrape the varnish off it, what's underneath um, in terms of our strategy? What is it that we are going to do to dot, 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 
make the world a safer place. And we end up uh, with this high level picture here. So, in order to make the, the world a safer place, we invest in four things. Okay, we are a big investor in research. And I'll come on to some of that in a moment. Big investor. We're a big investor in things to do with skills and education, uh, globally, particularly people from underrepresented and disadvantaged communities. Big investor there. Uh, we also invest in the public understanding of risk. Um, because, I'll just have a time out on that and then come back in. If we're here to make the world a safer place, then when we finish doing that job, in whose eyes is the world a safer place? And the answer is, it's in the eyes of society. And who makes up society? My mum and dad make up society. And my mum and dad get everything they know from the Daily Mail. Okay. Um, uh, it's an authoritative source of world information, the Daily Mail. And uh, they have anxieties, preconceptions, worries. They have beliefs. Some of them defy science. But they hold them, and they are real. Perception is reality. So if we're going to make the world a safer place, it's not only about physical sciences and engineering and making it safe for engineering, it's also through public understanding um, and uh, the public acceptance. Okay? So there's a big sociology, psychology dimension to what we need to do. So public understanding of risk. So I'll let link out, I'll link back in now. And the final thing that we do, of these four things at the top, is that we are able to act um, as a venture capitalist. Um, and my foundation does accelerate technology to application. And I say to application, uh, it could involve making money, it doesn't need to, as long as it's a social benefit. If it does make money, that's absolutely fine as well, because any money that does get made goes back in the charity pot and we can do more charity. Okay. So we, we do uh, act as a venture capitalist, and we are able to accelerate the uptake and application of technology, including its commercialisation. Um, and uh, last week, probably the week before, with my board, uh, we uh, signed off a um, uh, um, programme um, to invest in an accelerator. So it's a, um, it's a financial vehicle and initially we've put a few million pounds into this and we're going to start to uh, look for opportunities to invest in pre-commercial, early stage ideas uh, to get them through the valley of death, as it were, um, proof of concept, demonstrator, um, and, and take them further. And that accelerator will not be equity based. We will not take equity um, in these ideas. We just want to see great things succeed. Um, and not necessarily uh, do a dragon's den on them and want to take a proportion uh, at all. So, uh, those are the four things that we do. And in terms of research, so those four things, one of them was research, just get underneath that uh, and the bottom four bullet points are the research areas that we, uh, that we uh, prioritise. Um, and they've all got long titles to them, but basically, um, if you want to make anything safe, you have to think about three things. You have to think about, well, what is it, the asset? What's the design of it? What's the system? What's it built out of? Um, the second thing is, okay then, if that's what you intend to do, where are you going to put it? That's about the environment in which it's going to sit. And then the third thing is, and what about the people that are going to operate it? So you have the asset, the environment, and the people. And those first three bullet points up there are essentially uh, sort of general words for saying that really. Um, and then the fourth thing, emerging technologies, is that um, we've been in business for 257 years. If we're going to stop in business, we need to look over the horizon. We need to look at what's coming next, which takes us into this area of emerging technologies. And as I've said to my board, if we don't do this, we will have the best phone arrows in World War III. Right? Commercially. Um, we will become outmoded, outgunned, and we'll be playing catch up, um, and we won't, and we'll lose, and you know. And, and once our revenue dries up, then our social impact uh, uh, can't happen either. So, 
looking over the horizon, polishing up the crystal ball, looking at what's coming next, big, big, big part of it. And I said uh, right at the very beginning, I was going to talk about uh, disruptive technology and, um, and the risks from, and, I'll, uh, and that's one of the reasons, is because we're in this space. Okay? So that's us, um, and, and what we get up to. Um, here's some numbers as well, uh, just about us. Um, and um, so we, we're a pretty young foundation. Your Lloyd has been around for 257 years. The foundation has only been here for four years. Um, and uh, we've given around about £100 million in grants at the moment. Most of our grants are quite lumpy, uh, 10, 15 million pounds, some of them. Uh, we've got 75 active grants, 21 grants. So you see some numbers up there anyway, I'm not going to read them out. But it just gives uh, a, a feel for, you know, the, the size of it, to get your arms around it, what, you know, what does it feel like? And they're not just meant to be big numbers, it's, it's, a, it's just an indication of the scope. But we're growing, next year will be bigger, next year will be bigger than that. Um, and, um, and we'll see what we eventually grow into. Okay. Um, I've put these up because these are all on our website. These are documents, they're called foresight reviews. You can see the sorts of subjects that they're in nanotechnology, big data, resilience engineering, robotics and autonomous systems. Um, and uh, we commission these, uh, working with the best minds in the world, um, to war game some of these technology areas so that we can get our eye in ourselves so that we know whether there's space and opportunity for us to fund. Okay, now these are really interesting documents. Uh, I'd, I'd recommend reading them. Get them off our website, available at all good bookstores, get them at Amazon. You can't read them. Um, but you can get them uh, uh, off our website and uh, uh, have a read of them. They're written for my mum to read. Right, they're meant to be accessible, understandable. We try to strip out all the jargon um, and, uh, and, and cut right the way down to well, what is this technology? What's it capable of? What's its impact going to be? Uh, and out of all the things in the world, as Lloyd's Register, what could be the distinctive space that we could go and occupy? And then we can make our own decisions on the back of those. So there's eight of them up there, um, and uh, they're there for public consumption, but they help us as well as other people can build on them. Uh, they cost a lot to produce, because uh, we do convene experts from around the world, um, and uh, then we publish these. Uh, but they're openly and, free, and freely available on our website. So, um, in order to try and bring this to life a little bit, and I, I said that this isn't all going to be about noise register, um, but I just want to just give you, uh, try to put some colour in this picture now, because I've talked about strategy, I've talked about documents, I've talked about charitable purpose, but if I just bring this to life with just one or two uh, examples of things that we're funding, just helps you get your eye in, helps you calibrate a little bit of, of, of what we are and what we do. So this is really fascinating. I love this. This is really sexy. This is uh, the world's largest 3D printed metal structure. Happens to be a bridge and it's going to be uh, over a canal in Amsterdam. Um, and. Uh, it's interesting because you look in the Middle East uh, and Dubai and places have said uh, that they see uh, a big proportion, big percentage proportion of civic buildings being printed. Very interesting idea is all of this. Now the question is, this is a new technology, uh, printing metal, um, structural metal. Um, and that bridge, uh, once it's printed, and people start to walk across it, it's a pedestrian bridge, um, is it going to perform as per the calculations? Because we never built one. Does the printed steel behave like cast or wrought metal? Um, and so what we're doing is working with the developers, we're going to instrument this bridge, we're going to incorporate those instruments, uh, the sensors uh, at the time the printing is taking place, it's going to be a living laboratory going to stream data. That stream data is going to be openly and freely available on the internet for people to play with. So here we're going to have a data set of the performance of the world's first 
3D printed metal bridge and we'll learn from it and dot 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 we'll learn to make the world safer. So we're in that space, very interesting, very exciting. Um, this one here, Alan Turing, Alan Turing Institute. Um, for those that don't know, the Alan Turing Institute is a national institute set up by the government, happens to be based in London, the British Library, which is in this space of data science, data analytics, um, with applications into banking, financial sectors, um, uh, uh, retail, medical, um, and what can big data do in all those spaces? And we are inputting, my foundation, the engineering dimension to this uh, National Institute. Um, and we've done a load of stuff there in those indented bullet points there about, you know, you can read them yourself, all about the resilience of complex infrastructure. Um, and this thing called data-centric engineering, we've co coined this sort of phrase, data-centric engineering, and we're going to train data-centric engineers out of Turing, and making sure that engineers that go into the global workforce uh, understand uh, data, data science, uh, data analytics. Um, and the picture on the right is uh, meant to be blockchain. We have just done a, a, a really interesting piece of work through Turing, which is to look at the engineering applications of blockchain. Um, now, those that might understand, uh, and I don't fully understand it, I'll freely admit it, is this whole area of distributed ledgers and blockchain coming out of the financial market, uh, cryptocurrencies, bitcoins, all that sort of stuff. And it's a way of recording immutable transactions and verifying that that transaction took place. And I look at that and I think, I don't really understand it, but I think, dot, 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 that has got applications in engineering. Um, and uh, so we've done a piece of work in engineering applications of blockchain technology. Um, and the sorts of areas that we think we're going to be using it in is the assurance of very complex supply chains, uh, global supply chains, uh, for big critical infrastructures. So anyway, uh, talk about that afterwards. This is something completely different. This is in Turkey. This is a bus, when it's a truck. Um, there's got a classroom inside of it. Um, we helped uh, make this happen. Uh, we funded an organisation that commissioned and built and operated this bus. And it goes round um, marginalised, low income, um, isolated communities in Turkey. School children do not have access uh, to a science, engineering, uh, no capability, no infrastructure. They just don't receive it. Um, and so this travels around and delivers um, uh, that, that to uh, these, these great children. Um, so that's something, it's completely different from blockchain um, and how great that. Um, resilience engineering, um, this is something that we've done in collaboration with Arrow. Uh, resilience is all about the ability of a system or a structure to be able to absorb a big stress, whatever that stress may be, chuffing great big wave there, it could be something like that, or it could be economic, it could be extreme natural hazards. There's a number of things that can stress organize, stress infrastructure, even terrorism. Um, but the ability for a system, whatever that might be, to be able to absorb that stress, bounce back, recover, and learn. Okay, it's a whole new paradigm concept about how to make the world a safer place. So rather than having to keep thinking probabilistically about scenarios of what might happen and combinations of scenarios and then the likelihood and the frequency and the probability of these things happening and you end up modelling all of this very complicated world and then things happen that you never anticipated and you call them black swans. Rather than get in that headspace, why not think about how can we, when we've got these things on the drawing board, make them resilient? So it doesn't matter what happens to them, if they get stressed, they can absorb, recover, bounce back and learn. Um, and a uh, big programme on that, that's a £10 million grant uh, that we gave to Arab there. This is something else, these are, these are the lifeboats, the RNLI. I think most people have heard about the RNLI. And um, we're really proud to support the RNLI. So we uh, pay for uh, 
uh, via uh, a grant a donation, the sea survival training of every volunteer member of the RNLI. Uh, they ship them down to Port in Dorset um, and give them this sort of training. Um, and uh, as it says there, the RNLI, with the training uh, that we helped uh, provide, uh, saved the lives of 270 people last year at sea. The charity that saved lives at sea. So, working with and through other organisations. Um, just one or two others, really quickly, and then I'll shut up about Boys Register. That's Tim P. Um, we gave a really nice grant, really proud to have done this, to an organisation called the National Space Academy in York. Uh, did a lot about trying to get kids involved uh, in engineering and science through uh, Tim Peak and Space. Um, provided lots of teacher guides and material and that sort of stuff. Uh, and also, uh, we helped uh, fund some of the uh, school uh, inspired experiments that Tim Peake took to the space station and then the results straight back to kids' classrooms. Uh, we were really uh, happy to, to support a load of that. Um, so that's something uh, space-wise. Um, and robotics and autonomous systems, I'm going to speak up, I'll get my side. So that's sort of, so that's the Google Earth picture of the Lloyd's Register Foundation. Okay, um, and we're young, even though we've got this long heritage. Uh, I sometimes describe my foundation as a 257-year-old SME. Uh, it sometimes feels like that. We're a bit of a startup. Uh, you can see that we're out of the blocks. We're doing stuff. Uh, we're scaling up. Um, largest charity by revenue in the country. Probably the best way to think about it is like the Welcome Trust of Engineering. Okay. So, I'm going to move on a little bit now. Um, and uh, I said... Um, that uh, we do work on emerging technologies. Remember I was saying about looking over the horizon, uh, needing to know what's coming next? Um, I just want to say something about that in the sense of the benefits and risks that this all brings. So, a um, bit of a diagram picture here, and it's supposed to be industrial revolutions or technology revolutions that we in society have gone through. So from steam power, to electrical power, automation, uh, computers, and then we're into this future world of cyber. Um, you know, so really the sort of you know, 18th, 19th, 20th, and 21st centuries uh, are on there. Um, and uh, so we're now in this fourth industrial revolution. And, uh, you know, we are increasingly living in a world which is uh, very interconnected. The Internet of Things and autonomous, artificial intelligence. We are entering that world. Um, and it's interesting because it took more than a century uh, to get from the age of steam to the age of computers. Um, and it's taken only decades to get from the age of computers uh, to the data and digital age that we live in now. So the whole thing is compressing um, and accelerating very quickly. Uh, so the pace of change is really, really rapid. So we haven't got a century to get used to and think about this. This will be on top of us um, before we know. Um, now, these technologies are disruptive, and um, whether you look at this commercially or technologically, disruptive technologies, they don't just, um, um, just dislodge in this, an existing way of doing something. They don't just displace something like, oh gosh, there's a better way of doing this, so I'll take the old way out, and the new way goes in and everything left and right stays the same. It's not like that anymore, because these disruptive technologies completely rewrite the landscape. Um, they make things they, available that were not previously available, they create new markets that weren't there, new competitors, um, new clients, um, and they bring with them new risks and new benefits. So that's why we call them disruptive because they completely rewrite the landscape. They are paradigm shifting. 
these disruptive technologies. Um, and well, what are they? You know, these things like nanotechnology, big data, robotics, and autonomous systems, artificial intelligence, we're in that space. Okay. Um, so I just want to say something about data and digital, because I, I was talking to some students earlier on today, and I was saying, from our perspective as lawyers registered, if we could only spend our money on one thing, it would be this space. It's data and digital, big data. This is the paradigm shifting thing. So there's uh, some numbers on here and uh, a bit of a diagram picture. The diagram picture um, shows, uh, well, there's a time axis along the bottom, um, and then it's the world population at the top and the number of connected devices. And what that is essentially showing is that there are all already more interconnected devices on the planet than there are people via the Internet of Things. So, you know, this is your smartphone talking to um, your central heating system, your, your fridge talking to the supermarket, lots of things like that, the Internet of Things. Um, and we've already uh, well exceeded that, and by uh, 2020, uh, there's going to be uh, the order of about, you know, for each person on the planet, you know, seven interconnected devices per person. So, what's, what's happening in this world? Um, and then there are some statistics figures. I'm going to quickly run through this because these are really interesting. Um, if, 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 you could capture all the spoken words ever uttered on planet Earth since the beginning of time. If you could do that, and if you could digitise it, the space that it would occupy is estimated to be five excerpt bytes. Excerpt is 10 to the 18, so five with 18 norms on the end of it. Right. So that's the spoken word on planet Earth since the beginning of time. I don't know if that includes my wife or not, but uh, um, um, okay, so that, that gives you, you know, it's, it's big, you can't quite get your head around it, but you can conceptualise what, you know, that's a lot, that's a lot, that's a lot. The size of the digital universe, right, um, 2020, so the year after next, um, is going to be uh, 44 zeta bytes. Zeta is 10 to the 21. So exer is to the 18, zeta is 21 norms, three orders of magnitude bigger. Um, so there is massively more digital data on the planet, in the digital universe, than the spoken words since the beginning of time. Uh, and interestingly, 90% of all the data on planet Earth was created in the last two years. And it's going up um, exponentially. Um, and you think, well, that's really interesting. That's, uh, that's a real technological, oh, that's great. Can't we get, get down the pod and tell somebody? But dot, 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 this has some real interesting geopolitical angle to it as well. There's a figure there. Um, in 2013, 60% of all the data in the world was in the mature market. And by 2020, it will be the other way around. The 60% of the world data will be in developing countries. So that's interesting. That, what, what's the geopolitical implications of that? Right. Talk about disruptive technology. It's disrupting something. Right. What does that mean? What is, go what is going to be the consequence of that? I'm not saying good or bad, but it's a different world. Um, looking like that. Um, and then 21% of that data in the digital universe uh, will be in embedded systems. Right. These are artificial intelligence, um, these are the software systems that are running things that have got data. These are brains. Digital brains. Okay. So you begin to get a feel that something is happening um, and, you know, um, if you're the CEO of a large corporation, you can't ignore that. You don't know what it means, but you can't ignore that because the world in which we are doing business is different. 
geopolitically, technologically, completely. Um, just to get our head around as well, 44 zettabytes, so that's the size of the digital universe, did some calculations on the train coming off, that equates to 1,408 billion 32 gigabyte bytes. Right? Which if you had to pile them all up, would, it, would, would look like 612 and Fuji's. Wow, that might crop up down the pub in the pub quiz later, so go <laughs> Um, and this is a picture that I stole from somewhere, um, which is, um, you know, just shows how all of a sudden data in the world has just gone boom, uh, straight itself out. So here, so the sort of 1986, 93, 2000, it ends in 2007, so it's a decade out of date, already this picture. But you can really see that in 1986, very little um, uh, data on the world, in the world, and it was analog, okay, uh, which is uh, paper, books, that sort of thing. Um, and then, but what's happened? All of these other uh, digital sources of data um, uh, being produced and, and storing. And interesting, in 1986, 41% of all the computing power in the world was in pocket calculators. So something's going on. Okay. Um, now, all of this brings benefits uh, and it brings risks. I'm just going to close out and I'm going to say something about the public understanding of risks. Um, so, there's all these disruptive technologies going on, and that's just one of them. That just happens to be um, data and digital. Connected with that is cyber, connected with that is robotic and autonomous systems, we've got things like nanotechnology, and they all bring social. Um, uh, economic um, quality of life benefits, but they also bring risks. Bring risks to do with safety, privacy, um, cyber security, um, and also if you get it wrong and you're a big company, reputational risk. And if you lose your reputation, you can lose your business overnight. Uh, and we've seen some big companies that crash. Um, and you know, if, if you don't get this right uh, and you're in this world in, uh, and you get hacked or whatever, you know, big uh, reputational risks. So, benefits and risks, you know, upsides and downsides. It's life, that's what life's like, you know. Uh, you don't get anything for nothing. If you want all of this, you want all the benefits, then how do we head those risks off of the past? So I'm just going to leave that little bit there really is just illustrating the fact that the world is changing. It's changing in ways that we can't imagine. The implications and consequences are going to be quite fantastic. It brings a shed load of benefits because we all want it, but there are hazards and risks as well. Uh, and we need, to, we need to understand them. So I'm going to say something about the public understanding of risk, uh, and then I'm going to shut up. And uh, public understanding of risk. These are the number of slides that I produced for, as I said at the beginning, uh, a talk. I gave a talk in Bristol uh, and it was uh, to a, a load of people and I wrote this talk as though it was for my mum and dad. Okay. Because part of the public communication of science, public communication of risk, is not to say X and Zeta and big words like that, because, you know, uh, my mum would get it. Um, and so you've got to try and put it into a language that other people can understand. So how do you communicate all of this? But it's quite interesting, quite informative. Uh, so anyway, uh, risk. Everybody thinks risk is bad, risk is negative, risk is all about dying. Uh, and risk is something, um, you know, um, outside of everyday life. But in actual fact, you know, all of those things around there, we, we're, we have risks at work, what we put in our mouths, what we decide to eat is risky, whether we uh, take recreation or not, we can slip trips and falls, we do dangerous sports, uh, we travel, risks with everything, right? So this is all about bringing risk home, that risk is not something, um, an externality, this is something that is part of our everyday. And we make risk judgments all the time um, and weigh it all up. Um, and it's interesting, the psychology of, of risk, um, and it's irrational. 
is predictably irrational. Is the public tolerance and understanding of race. Um, you know, some people dread it, some people tolerate it, some people are, are okay if it's not me, but it's somebody else that's taking the risk. So that's an interesting thing. It's not just what is the risk, it's who's actually going to receive it. Because if it's me or my grandkids, it's a bloke down the road that really liked him. Fine, if he's, if he's subjected to this risk. Um, if it's uh, boat people being washed up on, on shores of Greece, that's really sad. I'll live with that. Uh, if it's my immediate family, can't live with that, right? So it's a really interesting psychology about tolerance of risk. Um, some people uh, like if it's predictable, some people if it's unpredictable. We've got facts versus beliefs, all these trade-offs going off anyway. Um, some people, if the risk is scientifically understood, feel a little bit more comfortable. If it's scientifically not understood, oh, can't tolerate that, okay? So, Wrapped up in all of this is a load of psychology, a load of sociology, a load of myths and beliefs. Um, interesting area. Um, and we all know this, uh, you know, we'll talk about risk, but what it is, and it's the likelihood of the consequence. Okay, uh, I talked about this, uh, this audience, uh, and uh, there's a chap called David Spiegelhalter at Cambridge, um, and uh, he talks about this thing called the micro mort. Okay, so a micro mort is a one in a million chance of dying. Okay, so it's a unit now. We've got we've got a unit to measure it in. Okay, um, and um, so it, you know you can start to compare things that are not the same, but using the same scale of micro morts. Um, so a micro mort, one in a million. I've just said that. Uh, and what does one in a million look like? It looks like flipping 20 one pound coins and they all end up heads. The probability of that happening uh, is one in a million. Okay, so you begin to feel what it's like now. Okay, your risk of dying, one in a million, and people think, well, flipping 20 coins and them all coming up heads are pretty, pretty unlikely. So that's what the micro mort is. So, Let's, um, uh, let's just look at some uh, activities in, in micromorts, and you end up there. So, you run a marathon, uh, the likelihood of you not finishing the marathon, uh, except in the back of the ambulance, seven micromorts. That's of you dying running a marathon. Seven in a million, statistically. Um, driving 10,000 miles, 33 micromorts, climbing Everest. I did yesterday, uh, 39,427, uh, I don't know, oh, it's quite risky climbing Everest, um, getting struck by lightning in a year, 0.1 of a micromore, but you know, uh, dying of a fatal cooking accident, you know, um, one, smoking one cigarette, uh, one and a half cigarettes, um, and driving 28 miles on a motorcycle, four micromore. So, you, it's really interesting, you can now start to intercompare things um, because you've got this unit of scale called a micro mold. Okay, and we've got a feeling for a micro mold while it is because it's 21 pound coins. Okay, then. Um, and uh, that's interesting there, that little graph up there, the um, annual risk of dying by age and sex in the UK. Okay, so age along the bottom and your micromorts on the side. So I'm 21, um, and uh, that means I've got uh, sort of here, you know, uh, 800 micromorts of dying this year just because I'm age 21. Okay, um, and uh, just as a thought experiment, if I happen to be 60, then I've got uh, one in 10,000 chance of dying. <laughs> okay. Uh, interestingly, so the, from the previous graph, age seven is the safest age to be in terms of microbots. Okay. Um, in early life, there's a, um, a you know, high risk of young babies, seven, that's your maximum, and then you start to do silly things, and then you reach your teenage years, and, and then you get old. And, um, 
So age seven, safest age to be, um, uh, and that's about 100 micromores, uh, and by comparison that equates to 30,000 miles on a road cycle. So it's really interesting, you can start to play with this, this concept of a micromore once you've got it. Um, another way of doing it is with bananas. Um, and uh, uh, still talking about risk. Um, and uh, so bananas contain radioactivity, they contain potassium 40, naturally radioactive. Um, and uh, so you can, you can start to say, um, well, how many, what, what's the risk uh, from the radiation in the banana? Because you know the risk of radiation exposure. And then you can say, take all those activities that were on the previous slide and say, how would that equate to our intensive bananas? Um, bullet point, far right hand side, bananas contain potassium 40, just said that, naturally radioactive, half life of 1.25 billion years. So that's helpful. So if you have a banana and you leave it on the worktop in the kitchen for 1.25 billion years, uh, then the amount of potassium 40 in there would have decayed away to half uh, what it was. So if you leave it, uh, for two and a half billion years to go down to a quarter. So you can cut down your radiation, it goes a bit black, but, uh, uh, and the banana emits about 15 radioactive disintegrations a second, just sitting there quite naturally, 15 radioactive disintegrations a second. Um, and I think the human body uh, emits something like 250, I think, is a figure that comes to mind. Um, not necessarily from uh, uh, potassium-40, but from other radioactive elements and, uh, uh, as well. So, anyway, uh, and then you end up with, uh, you know, um, average radiation dose of people living in Cornwall. Cornwall has got granite. Granite has uranium in it. Uranium decays to radon. Radon's a gas. It comes up to uh, quite natural. Um, radiation dose. Uh, living in Cornwall is equivalent to 18,000 bananas. Uh, the approximate dose of Fukushima Town Hall in the two weeks following the accident was the same as 18,000 bananas. Right. And you know, it should be higher than that. You know, um, thousand bananas. Flight from New York to London because of cosmic radiation. Uh, less shielding up there than down at ground level. 700 dental x wave 50. And sleeping next to somebody um, gives you is equivalent to half a banana. Right. The person next to you is radioactive. Okay. So if you're going to sleep with two people, sleep. Don't sleep in the middle, I think, is, is the advice. Um, uh, which is equivalent to the small puff of a cigarette. <laughs> I'm going to move on. Um, value of a human life. Um, because uh, a, a lot of things to do with risk um, also boils down to. Um, um, well, how much are you willing and prepared to pay to save that risk? And if the risk is going to uh, be fatal, you, know, you are talking about risks that statistically could lead to people, um, you know, statistically people losing their lives, then how much is, uh, are we as society prepared to pay to save um, that detriment? Okay, so a little thought experiment here. Um, so, sorry about that. Um, um, you know, I've already mentioned that flipping 20 coins is uh, one in a million chance of them all coming up heads. Okay, so thought experiment. If, if I said to you, okay, then you've got 21 point, uh, 21 pound coins, and you flip them all in the air, and every time they do not, all of them come up heads, I'll give you a fiver. Right. Every time they do not, I'll give you five quid. Would you accept that? Oh, and by the way, if they do come up heads, I'll kill you. <laughs> right. And I will. Right. Because I'm like that. Um, would you accept that? Would, would anybody accept it? Five quid, down the pool. Right. Would anybody do it? Yeah. You would? Yeah? So you valued one micromore to five pounds, um, which means that you valued your life at five million pounds. That's the value that you put on your life, right? If I said, would you do it for a tenner? 
Would you do it for a hundred quid? Would you do it for a thousand quid? Would you do it once for a thousand quid? Would you do that? Yeah, would you do it for a hundred? And it's interesting because there's no right or wrong answer, but you end up in a space, you know, uh, I said it once, you know, it's highly unlikely, yeah, I'd do it, you know, I've weighed it all up. Um, so you just fight valued your life at five million quid, and it's interesting, the Department for Transport um, value uh, uh, one micro more at one pound sixty. So if you phone up the Department of Transport and say, uh, could you like come and put a zebra crossing at the bottom of my road, because I have to cross it every day and it's a bit dangerous. And uh, if it carries on, I'm going to get run over. And they'll say, leave it with us. And what they do, they look at, um, well, how many people died at the end of your road? What's the likelihood of all this? What are they going to save? You know the, you know the cost of a zebra crossing. Um, um, and when they divide them together, the magic number that they're working at is £1.60 per micro. Okay, 1.6 million pounds is what they put on the value of the human life. You have to do it. Okay. Um, I just want to say something about coincidence, and then I'm going to shut up. Um, um, it's good because people talk about you know risk, and then they it's it's, it's a very interesting thing. It's coincidence because things happen, um, and people say oh, that was a coincidence. And sometimes I say that's spooky. That's really you know I went on holiday. And I sat next to somebody in a bar on a terrace that lives in the same house that my grandma's best friend used to. And you think, oh, strange, you know. And you think, you know, probability and coincidence. Once you, you can explain this statistically as well. So, um, and it's interesting um, that, uh, you know, how some things catch our attention and, and some things that, that, that we dismiss. Um, and, uh, and we quite often attribute something as being, wow, wasn't that a coincidence after the event? Okay, so, and I put this up, so last bullet point there. Uh, so uh, I picked some numbers on the National Lottery. Those are my numbers at the top. Okay, um, and, uh, and the, the numbers underneath are the numbers that, that came out on that Saturday, so I lost. Right, and uh, not significant. I didn't win the lottery, right? Um, and I'm not surprised that I didn't win the lottery. But what is the chance of my six numbers and then those six numbers from Camelot coming up? Because I had a choice of six numbers from all of them, and Camelot then as well. It, the, the, the chance was, it's down there, look, 200 with a load of notes on the end, right? Highly, highly improbable. That outcome was highly improbable, right? Um, um, but I attracted <coughs> no significance to it because um, it didn't mean anything to me, okay? But something highly improbable happened and I attracted no significance to it. Okay then, uh, this is interesting, if there are 23 people in a room, then there's a 50% chance that two of them will share the same birthday. That means that if you're on a football pitch and you've got two teams and the referee, then two of those players or the referee, uh, there's a 50% chance that they will share the same birthday. Right. Um, Whereas you're down the pub and you're in a group of people and you go, oh, my birthday's on so-and-so. Well, mine is. Wow, isn't that amazing? That, you know, and you think, no, statistically, it's quite probable that that's going to happen. So if you've got 28 people in a room and you have a bet that two of them will have a birthday within plus or minus one day of each other, you've got a 95% chance of winning. So you get 28 people down the pub, you wait that bet, 95 times out of 100, you're going to win, statistically. Okay, um, but most people who experience it would, would think that is an enormous coincidence. They would ascribe some significance to it, but statistically, it's quite probable anyway. Okay, um, and uh, it's interesting that if you ask people about risk, then you will find that people overestimate the risk of death from low probability causes, 
uh, and then conversely over underestimate the risk of death from high probability causes. So uh, there's a graph here. Um, if people believed um, what is actually uh, empirically the truth, you would lie on that blue line. Um, and you've got uh, annual deaths along the bottom. So you take something like cancer, stroke, diabetes, or dying of electrocution, people think, oh, that happens, you know. Um, and, uh, and they will um, uh, underestimate that. Whereas you take something like dying in a flood, dying of murder, uh, botulism, and it's the other way around. Okay. So, anyway, uh, to summary there, you know, we do face dangers in every day of our life. Uh, you know, it's a funny old thing, it's probability theory. It's a man-made construct, it doesn't exist in nature. We made it all. Probability theory, we made it all. Um, it's a man-made construct, it's very, very complicated. People in the street don't understand it. Um, so how do you communicate likelihood and probability? Microbots, bananas, coincidences, it's just one way of getting it out. People have different tolerances of risk, different acceptances, whether I'm going to receive it or whether it's somebody else. Um, and, uh, and people uh, uh, overestimate uh, uh, things that they're not familiar with uh, and underestimate things that they are familiar with. And, uh, you know, humans are predictably irrational. So, um, thank you very much. talking about probabilities for events that actually had happened so you could measure their, their likelihood. Um, but looking at your, your history, I remember reading Command and Control by Eric Schlosser about the actual um, systems that we put in place to control nuclear weapons and how they measured the safety and the likelihood of them going off or being deployed accidentally. Talking about things like single point safe. And he realised that because it never actually happened, the way he measured the risk was extremely um, subjective. So, given your experience, what would you have to say about that? Yeah. Uh, no, you're right. I mean, we, we, we were doing it in, in lots of other areas and not just, you know, the, the example that, that you gave, um, where, um, you know, the way that it ends up being done is, is um, is you know if you've got a scenario which is something going off uh, unplanned um, or something failing or whatever, then in, if you look at it as a scenario, then what are all the contributions and the sequence of things that have got to happen or go wrong in order for it to get there? You break it down into this followed by that combined with this, um, and then it boils down to expert best judgment um, as to um, uh, well, what's the likelihood of that happening, that little step, and what's the probability um, and the outcome of it if it happened. And that boils down to expert to best judgment because there's probably no data. Um, and also, even the scenario, if it's never happened before, is someone's best guess uh, of how it might unfold. So the whole thing is subjective and it's based on expert best judgment. Um, and in the absence of, of anything better, it's a good way to do it. Um, and uh, you know, and this is why I was talking uh, a moment ago about resilience. You know, because another way of, of doing this, a complementary way, not an alternative way, is to say, well, things happen that you don't want to happen. Um, and so, how could you actually make the system resilient? So, if it does, and when it does happen. Um, it's fail safe or can 
um, you know, uh, recover and bounce back from that, probably not from the nuclear explosion, but, you know, from, from other things that might go wrong. So, you know, uh, life isn't perfect, life isn't ideal, life isn't black and white, and in the absence of anything, but you've got to do something, then you know, doing it in the way that you just described is scientifically one way of doing it. And it boils down to expert judgment at the end of the day. Thanks for a really interesting talk. Um, I was just uh, a question formulating, and it might exactly not be there right, uh, but um, I was interested in um, uh, you saying trying to make the world safer, and you presented like three concepts of what adds to a risk, and two of those are kind of controllable, aren't they? But the last one, which is human fallibility, is it's quite difficult to deal with. Do you think that the general kind of progress towards this safety is actually trying to suppress the human element within the system in a way that perhaps they're the riskiest part of this process and then the drive of bigger data and these sorts of things? Is there something philosophical about this? Well, there is. You, know, you said you were formulating the question, so I'm going to formulate the answer. Um, I, um, I think you're right, you know, uh, quite often the weak link in the system is the human. Um, but then there's sometimes also the strong link in the system, because they have common sense and intuition and emotion. Um, and they, they, they're able sometimes to say, I know that all, that all the signals are, it is fine, but it doesn't feel fine. I just, you know, I just, there's something inside of me. So, Intuition and all of that is, is really important from humans as well. Um, and, um, you know, and so going forward um, in a world of artificial intelligence and, uh, and robotic and autonomous systems, I think it's, isn't it interesting how you can take human fallibility out of the loop by uh, having uh, an artificial intelligent control, um, but then how do you still have the human override that can say uh, actually that, that's not right um, and uh, you know and you get the best of, of both worlds um, it is philosophical it's a dilemma I don't know what the answer is but this is the world that we're going into um, and we have to we have to balance uh, all of this off I don't know that has an answer though. Hi. Uh, yeah, I was interested when you mentioned about black swans and resilience of black swans. It isn't the whole purpose of a black swan is that it's only for seeing looking back in hindsight. So when you test the resilience of a city, you're testing it for the resilience of a predetermined set of failures to see how well it bounces back. But you might still end up with a black swan that just defines everything that you look back on it and you go, oh, we didn't test it for that scenario and it's still black swan, and it still fails. Yeah, you know, because there's, there's no there's silver bullet to this, there's no ideal, perfect, risk-free, 100% certain way of doing anything and, you know, risk included. And, um, but, you know, what resilience is all about is, it's not scenario-based, it's not, you know, um, um, you know, it's not probabilistic. So, you know, to me, if you take, you know, I don't know whether I mentioned this whilst I was talking or not. Um, if you take Fukushima, um, um, if, if you'd have looked at the design of Fukushima from a resilience point of view, um, then you would have said, okay, let's assume that it floods because of a tsunami. Um, and, uh, and the probabilistic modelers would have said, well, actually, that's quite unlikely because of the return frequency and the height of waves and the data says. So they'd have they'd said it's unlikely. But from a resilient point of view, you'd have said, well, let's, let's just assume it's going to happen. So, um, you know, what does that mean? And if it floods, all the uh, backup generators are below sea level, so they flood, and so you've lost all the power. 
and the resilience answer would have been just to move them up the side of the hill a little bit further, that's all, and have a longer lead coming from them. Um, and so being resilient is, is just taking a, you know, a, a sort of a shit happens sort of view of life um, and, 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 and a bit of common sense as well because you can't say, oh well, you know, we might get hit by a meteorite, so you know, what can we do about that? Because then, yeah, then you're spending a load of money to save something that's not really actually going to happen. Um, you know, so it's, it, is a, it is a happy balance, but you, you look at the world through a different lens. Um, and it, I think a combination of, of looking at scenarios and probabilistic and stochastic modelling alongside, uh, let's just be a bit of common sense resilience, I think we'll end up with uh, safer systems. I would like to ask a question, but I would also like to show some guests if the people may be agreeing. But I would like to ask a question. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. I was wondering if you ever come across situations that make things safer for people today, but less safe for people in future generations, and if so, how you assess risks in that way, and if is it a future people more valuable than us or less valuable than us? <laughs> yeah, it's a really good system, isn't it? Oh, good question. You know, a discounted life. Um, yeah, it's interesting, isn't it? I think, you know, I think. I mean, we, 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 we have done that. As a society, we have done it. You know, we, we do things because of an imperative today in the belief that um, technology will find a solution for it. Um, and, um, you know, if you take things like nanotechnology, um, you know, I mean, the deodorant that I put on before coming out, uh, hopefully, um, has got micro silver in it, nano silver, um, and silver at, at, on a nano scale um, is uh, is uh, sort of an anti anti fungicide. Um, stops things growing, stops things smelling. Now the point is fine. What's all I, what's, what's my underarm got to do with this? Um, the point is is that all of these nano particles, um, where do they end up? So I have a shower. Uh, where does all that go, right? Some of it got absorbed into my body, no doubt. So I've got nano silver in there, and a lot of it ends up, um, you know, somewhere. Um, and uh, it's not just, you know, uh, underarm stuff. It's you know, lots of nano things uh, in in materials, nano enabled devices. And the point I'm making is that uh, is that we don't know, but that is going to end up in the environment, it's going to get recycled, it may bioaccumulate somewhere we don't know. Um, and, and, and dot 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 dot, what does it mean for the future generation? It doesn't really matter because we've got some deodorant today, okay, and I've got my nano enabled device today, um, and something for future generations, and I think we do it all the time, um, and we, we do discount whether deliberately or not, the value of a future life. And in your models, it's the it's the current generation that you're looking at. No, I'm not. I don't, I'm not. I'm not really. I don't have a model. Oh, okay. No, as such, um, you know, um, you know, I want to make the world a safer place uh, as a foundation. Um, and uh, you know, I think you know, a future life is just as valuable as, as a today's life. Um, but it's interesting, you know, would you, would you as an individual, uh, if, you know, this is a horrible scenario, but someone said, if, um, you know, if you give me a hundred pounds and I can save this starving child, there, there, real, real, there, we say yes, right, it's real, it's in the moment, yes, so would you give one and I'll save you a child's life, uh, you don't, I can't say who it is yet not born, but, in a uh, hundred years' time, you'd, you'd probably say, well, no, actually, whoever's around in a hundred years' time can, you know, to me. So even psychologically, we're discounting, you know. Thank you. My mind relates to the point you made.
estimate that 60% of babies housed or found or linked with mature markets. By 2020, that will be switched to 60% of the development markets. Um, my is a how and what question. How is, how is this percentage calculated, first of all? And secondly, what would be the reasons for the switch? Because I can see major implications for world economies. Yeah, and, and the answer is I don't know. You know, uh, you know, this is some uh, data that, that uh, I borrowed, um, and uh, but I can imagine how it's going to happen. Um, that we've got a, a, a growing world population uh, in these countries that are all going to start to have the standard of living and access to technology that we have. Uh, so it's not that we slow down, it's that, that all of these other people that haven't got it catch on and there's more of them so they overtake. Um, you know, uh, and so I can understand how volumetrically it just ends up in, in these developing countries. Um, you know, they, they, will, they will aspire, attain uh, the lifestyle that you have. And, uh, and with it, you know, your digital vapor trail um, will be the same for all of these the people in developing countries. Their industries will grow. So I can understand how it will come about that way. And your point about, you know, what, what the implications of that is going to be, I've got no idea. But it's, the world is different. It's in a very, very short time span, isn't it? It is. This is 2020. Mm. Quite remarkable. Sorry. It, it will be quite remarkable. Yeah. Well, yeah. You know, and it's an estimate, it's a scenario, and someone says a date and a number, you know, and we believe it. And I think it's a trend, it's a direction of travel, whether it's 2020, 2021, 2025, whether it's 60% or 58 or 60, you know. The fact is, is that a centre of gravity is shifting. Hello. Uh, you talked about risk, so I was talking about hazard. I mean, for ex I'll give you an example. In, in Brighton, when the Green Party were in the council, they reduced a lot of the speed limit from down from 40 or 30 down to 20 miles an hour. The thing was that because it was less hazardous if you got knocked down by a car at 20 miles an hour than if going at 30, but the trouble was that people then decided, well, I'll, I'll chance my luck and, and run across the road. The resulting was that the more people got knocked down by cars than, than, than had previously been doing. Um, how do you sort of, uh, this effect of risk versus hazard? It's, a, it's an interesting, you know, because, uh, you know, um, if, if there was a, I mean, there's a bottle of water on there, right, and that's hazardous, right, that's, that's a hazard, because if that ended up in my lungs, I would drown, right, so that, that, that's a hazard, right, but it's not a risk, because it's, some, you know, how does it get, you know, uh, from there, you know, so, and, and there's lots of things that are hazards, um, and, um, um, you know, and how, how do you, you know, um, um, you know, t t how, you know, what, what are the steps that are going to turn that hazard uh, into, uh, into, into a risk? Um, so, I, I, I don't feel I'm answering your question very well, but, uh, but there is, as you're right in saying, a, a, a distinction between hazard and risk. Um, um, I've got some friends here from the HSC. You, you know all about hazard and risk. I'm Andrew Caroline, I think there are two houses that you've got in there. The car on the first, the March reduced the risk of one hazard and increased the risk of the other. So it illustrates the point which we're making about systems. You need to think about the system as a whole, and not need to be because they are in a very delicate balance. Um, and changing one might disrupt another. Yeah, I was going to say that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, I just want 
Have you found people have been receptive to the idea of micromods in terms of trying to get across risk? Because it seems, um, if you're talking to your mum and dad, and that framing risks in terms of debts is quite an emotive, emotive way of putting it. Uh, do people <coughs> catch on with that quite easily, or do they, do they see micromods, debts, and get a little bit wary thinking about it? That's a good question, actually, because you know, we, um, risk is good, risk and reward. Um, we, we calculate risk in financial investments uh, for a, a payback. So there is a, a positive upside to risk. Um, and you're quite right, once you start to talk about the risk of death and, and micro wars, you're sort of, you know, trying to, you're doing something that we're trying to move away from, which is risk has this connotation of being, as being dark and fatal. Um, you know, so that's, that's the downside of micromores, but the upside of it is it is a way of being able to normalise a load of things that seem completely disconnected, like smoking, uh, riding a bike, being age seven, and you get a way of, um, of being able to have a dialogue about something because you've got a unit that explains it all. Thanks for the talk. Uh, regarding the big data, I was uh, recently watching a TED talk uh, about this lady and uh, it's quite impressive to see how much uh, the data are growing over the recent years. But are they really meaningful or we have a lot of data and they are just there and we don't know, they are not carrying any information. Uh, this lady was, uh, um, uh, was uh, in uh, Asia during the day. Uh, 2005, around then, those years, and then she was working uh, with Nokia, for Nokia. And Nokia told her, look, uh, uh, we want to know what is the next device that, uh, that, that is, is part of the country wants. And uh, uh, at the same time, Apple was working on the iPhone, and they were comparing the wage, the average wage of the people there, so now they are never going to be interested in the iPhone. And uh, instead, uh, what happened is that uh, they were uh, what she uh, when they were analyzing the data and the data were saying that they cannot buy the iPhone, uh, but then they realized that uh, they were willing to spend all their monthly monthly uh, salary for buying the, mm -hmm. the the iPhone. So how much are they valuable, and when we have to uh, go back to where we have more data but more uh, thought about them? I'm not. I'm, I'm sorry. I didn't catch the question. <laughs> oh, I, I'm going to look up that TED talk. But. <laughs> so, how much this data, this big data, are available, and how much instead the meaning that we uh, we were able to introduce on the data that we had ten years ago was very compared to what is value, with the value of the big data that we have now. We are we are making decisions based on what an algorithm says to us about the big data, so we have to do this. Why probably 15 years ago we were making decisions based on way less data and more uh, personal thoughts about them? So are you saying that um, you know, we're making future decisions on data that we've got today in the same way that in 2005 Nokia were making decisions about future iPhones, but they would but, but they were based on big data, the, the big data they had back then. Mm -hmm. Instead, when we were free of big data, we were making decisions based with, on much fewer data, but probably uh, adding a much stronger uh, thought about this, think about this data. So we were thinking about the, the few data that we had and making decisions instead of being driven by the big data, the analysis of the big data. I, th I think I think you're right. I don't know whether this answers your question or not, but uh, you know, because um, you're, you're talking about thinking, and you know, when we've got a paucity of data, we have to think more about it. Um, and uh, you know, um, the, 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 the danger is in a big data world is that uh, you know you end up with the computer says syndrome. Don't really understand how it got there, but the computer says. 
um, and uh, um, the whole world is a black box, right? But, you know, some artificial intelligence system, load of data, load of crunching, uh, and the computer says to five decimal places is the answer, and then we literally believe it. Um, and if we look at the financial crash, um, you know, the, and that the financial crash happened um, because uh, very complex uh, commodities were put together that involved risk. Uh, they were bundled together. Um, only some deep mathematicians really understood what they thought they were doing. Um, but then um, uh, investors and that started to use the models, output, the computer says, uh, started to buy these, didn't really understand them, um, and, and, then, and then we had a crash. So the danger is, um, the only point I'm making, is, uh, is just having a literal, um, uh, just taking uh, whatever big data is telling us at face value without the intellectual overrides that you're talking about. Okay, there are some, there are some questions downstairs. I think that's another opportunity. If somebody has a question you'd like to ask, which you will be there for a little while, please, so it would be easy to ask a question there. Yeah, yeah. Thank you very much, everybody.